many of you will remember the story of Emily Hand, the nine-year-old girl who was held hostage in Gaza for 50 days and was released from captivity during the temporary ceasefire in November. Emily was kidnapped by Hamas from, by Hamas from Kibbutz Be'eri on October 7th. Her father, Thomas, like so many parents of kidnapped children after October 7th, assumed that he would never see his daughter again. So he was elated when he learned that Emily would be among the second group of hostages to be released as part of the ceasefire deal in late November. And when Thomas Hand saw his daughter for the first time since she had been abducted, he was immediately struck by two things. After their initial emotional embrace, he was able to look into his daughter's face for the first time in nearly two months, and he saw that her face was chiseled. When she was abducted on October 7th, she had the chubby face of a young girl, but when she came home, she had the chiseled face of a grown woman, the face of someone who had aged years in just 50 days. And the second thing that Emily's father noticed was that she was incapable. She couldn't do it. She was incapable of speaking at full volume. She could only whisper. Her father could barely hear a word she was saying. He literally had to put his ears to her lips simply to understand her. And that's because Emily had been conditioned to not make any noise whatsoever while she was held in captivity. She hadn't used her full voice in 50 days. And when she was released, she had to relearn how to speak at full volume. Emily is traumatized. She is wounded in the deepest of possible ways, and she will be for the rest of her life. In this morning's Torah portion, we read of the early years of Moses' life and the trauma that he endured as a young child. Moses was born into a world of genocide. A new pharaoh who did not know Joseph had ascended the throne and decreed that all Israelite baby boys were to be cast into the Nile. But when Moses was born, his mother, Yochevet, could not bear to part from her son. So she hid him for three months, which was as long as she could. And during those months, Moses' mother had no choice but to keep him quiet, just like those horrific stories of parents keeping their infants quiet for 24 hours or more. On October 7th, Moses' mother had to keep him quiet for months to keep him hidden from the Egyptians. But eventually, she could not keep him quiet anymore. So when he turned three months old, she placed him in a wicker basket and placed that basket in the Nile, and he floated down the river until he was discovered and saved by Pharaoh's daughter, who was bathing in the river. As the text tells us, When she opened the basket, she saw that it was a child, a boy, crying. And there are two issues with that verse that I want to draw your attention to this morning. The first is that the text tells us that Pharaoh's daughter saw Moses crying. But crying is usually described as something you hear, not something you see. So one way to understand that verse is that Pharaoh's daughter didn't hear Moses crying because he wasn't crying audibly. He was crying silently. Tears were streaming down his face, but he made no noise because like Emily Hand, Moses had been conditioned to remain silent. He was afraid to cry out loud. In fact, there's a Midrash which teaches that Moses tried to hold back his tears. He tried to remain completely silent and calm. But the angel Gabriel struck him and forced tears to stream down his face so that Pharaoh's daughter would take pity on him and save him. And for the rest of his life, Moses struggles to express himself. The Torah teaches that he was kvad peh, heavy of mouth, and kvad lashon, heavy of tongue. And those speech issues can be traced directly back to Moses' early experience of childhood trauma, of being forced to remain hidden and silent for months. That trauma and those wounds remained with Moses for the rest of his life. And like Moses, I am sure that Emily Hand will be traumatized and wounded for the rest of her life. And the second issue with that verse is the fact that the Torah uses both the word yeled, which means infant or young child, and the word na'ar, which means adolescent boy or young man, 
to describe Moses. And all in the same verse, When she opened the basket, she saw that it was an infant, a young man, a na'ar, crying. So the rabbis, of course, asked the inevitable question, how could Moses both be a yelled, an infant, and a na'ar, a young man? How can one person be both at the same time? Well, according to the rabbis, Moses' body was the body of a yelled. He had the body of an infant, but his voice was the voice of a na'ar, of a young man, or even the voice of an adult. In other words, because Moses had already experienced and lived through so much trauma, he had aged at an incredibly accelerated rate. His body was the body of a baby, but spiritually and psychologically, he had already become an adult. Being born in Egypt not only robbed Moses of his freedom, but it robbed him of his innocence. And on October 7th, we were all robbed of our innocence. The Israeli author and journalist Yossi Klein Halevi has said many times since October 7th that in one morning, we went from being the best adjusted Jews in history to being among the most traumatized Jews in history. Our reality, the reality that Israel would always be a safe haven for the Jewish people and that Jews would always feel safe here in the United States, that reality was shattered all in a single day And even if some of us still have the bodies of young children, spiritually and psychologically, all of us are now adults. All of our faces are now chiseled. On October 7th, an entire generation of Jews was traumatized. We were wounded. We were robbed of our collective innocence. And from the very beginning of his life, Moses, too, was traumatized. And yes, that trauma defined Moses. But he took that pain, he took that trauma, and he turned it into compassion. That trauma caused Moses to become the great compassionate leader that he ultimately became. Our tradition teaches that after Moses fled from Egypt and he was working as a shepherd in Midian, one of his sheep once wandered away from his flock and he pursued that sheep until he found it drinking from a stream. And then Moses said to that sheep, I didn't realize you were so thirsty. You must be very tired from having run so far. You don't have enough strength to walk back on your own. So he lifted that sheep onto his shoulders and he carried it all the way back to the flock. And when God saw the way that Moses acted towards that sheep was such compassion, that is when God decided that Moses was the right person to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. As God says to Moses in that Midrash, since you have shown such great compassion towards your flock, I will entrust my flock, the people of Israel, to you. Moses could have allowed his trauma to make him a bitter, vengeful person, but that's not who he became. Like Churchill or Lincoln or Dr. King, Moses used his trauma. He used his wounds to become a compassionate leader and ultimately to become the person who led our ancestors from slavery to freedom. Moses did everything in his power to ensure that the next generation would not experience the same trauma that he experienced. He used his wounds to make the world a better place. At this moment, we are all deeply, deeply wounded. We're all traumatized. Since October 7th, all of our faces have become chiseled. But this is the moment to follow in the footsteps of Moshe Rabbeinu, of Moses, our great teacher. Like Moses, we should use our wounds, use our trauma to create positivity in the world, to make this world a better place so that no one should ever again have to experience what Emily Hand lived through in Gaza. And so that no yelled, no child, will ever again have to cry out with the voice of an adult. Shabbat Shalom.